Hi there, it's Micha. I'm sitting here with my sister and we are doing the last of our series of videos around the Loki TV show. <laughs> Hi guys. Okay, as usual we start with a big question. How did you like this episode and what are your favorite scenes? How would you rate it? Mm, I give it a 9. My favorite scene, this is a tricky one. I think it was all in all really good. For me the best scene is always when it's really funny and that was missing this week. So <laughs> all of it was okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how would you rate the series as a whole? As a whole, I would give it 9 out of 10. Definitely. I really liked it and from all the Marvel series we saw at this point with WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier, that was my favorite one. Um, yeah. Okay. I would agree there. I think in the rating video I didn't say something about the whole series and I would also think it has to land around a 9 maybe even a tick higher. I think I rated all the episodes 9 except for one, which was 9.5. So I guess it also would land mathematically at 9. That also seems to be fair because I was a little bit struggling with the last episode, as I said in the review video, but we will touch on that later on again. Yeah. Okay, not strictly regarding favorite scenes or something, but there are two callouts that I had for this week's episode. And the one thing was that I thought it was quite funny that Loki said he can't be trusted, while Sylvie is the one who can't trust. And then at the end of the scene it turned out that Sylvie as well cannot be trusted, because she pushed him through the portal back into the TVA while he was ready to trust her. Mm. And the other call out I have is that I hope they fix one thing very quickly in season two, because I didn't much like it that Mobius didn't know who Loki is. And we have spent so much time in watching that relationship grow, and if they just pissed that away, I would hate that. Yeah, definitely. I would hate it too. Okay, so let's continue with the updates on our previous theories and I have to say this is a short one because most of the theories were basically thrown out of the window and became irrelevant due to the finale. Only three things need to be discussed and the first thing is what was Sylvie's Nexus event? They didn't really clarify that and personally I tend to think that maybe there was no Nexus event at all and she was just taking out of a timeline so that she can end up with the other Loki variant in the presence of He Who Remains. Yeah, it's possible. I will likely call him Kang a lot in this video because yeah. this is the name we will know him in the future. They did their best not to call him Kang in the show, but as we all know, the actor will be the one playing Kang in all future... Yeah, but in the comics, he who remains is really one variant of Kang, and every variant of Kang has another backstory. Yeah. And he who remains is the first one of them who appears. I think he is having a similar storyline in the comics as in the show, that he is the more benevolent Kang variant. And he is called, if I remembered correctly, Immortus or something like that in the comics. Yeah. But yeah. at the end of the day, uh, there are different variants of Kang for sure. But he is starting out as Kang, the scientist in the, I think, 31st century or something. Yeah. And that's so correct. that's the reason why I guess I will just call them all Kang, even if they are... Different between the variants, okay? Exactly. If they are different in appearance and whatever. Okay, so what do you think about that? Is there really a Nexus event? Because it seems to be that Ravona is involved in some capacity in that whole scenario and she has that smirk whenever she talks about taking Sylvie. So I'm not 100% sure if my theory is correct or if Maybe there's something more that we don't know yet. Yeah, it's possible that Ravona knew that there wasn't really an Nexus event, but that Sylvie would play a big role in the future. And yeah, it's possible that that was the only reason why she was taken. Okay, another thing that we can pick up is the question around Miss Minutes. So, of course, we all said, hey, Miss Minutes is just an in-between and nothing more. Mm. I guess she still is just an in-between, but between... Kang or He Who Remains mm -hmm. and the TVA, but she at least looked a little bit more sinister this week and she looked yeah. a little bit more like having an own agenda as well. Mm -hmm. She at least seems to have an own will because He Who Remains says, hey, she is still calling me He Who Remains? Okay, I like it. And that tells us that at least she is an artificial intelligence or yeah. maybe even more. Yeah. Maybe a sentient being that was just put in place there. 
I think she's kind of a technology from the 31st century, mm. which we can't quite understand yet. Mm. How she works and what she is and so on. Uh, we cannot forget or we should not forget that Kang has access to technology yeah. from each period of time. And what I heard in the internet in one video, someone said that Miss Minutes basically is the advanced version of Jarvis oh, okay. to a certain point mm -hmm. so that the technology behind Jarvis mm -hmm. was created and enhanced and she is the highest form we have seen yet. Mm -hmm. And the third thing, of course, is, and we already touched on that, we were at least with that one spot on that Kang is behind it all. Yeah. Even though it is a different iteration, as we just said. Mm -hmm. But uh, interesting there is that Angie said in one of the Easter eggs last week that in the comics, Elias, this cloud monster, is one of the arch enemies of Kang. And here it seems to be different. Here he was harnessing the power of Elioth to yeah. help get where he is, basically. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, the comics are always a nice source for Easter eggs and information, but the MCU almost always goes some kind of different ways yeah. with it. That's right. Okay, next up, maybe have a quick roundup around our final prediction last week. And we were, I guess, completely off, except for the Kang angle. But at least both of them are still alive. So yep. that's a good thing. Uh, they are not being put on the timeline yet, but mm -hmm. that might happen in season two. We will see. I predicted that this will be a standalone story in season two and will have nothing to do with the TVA. I, was, yeah. I guess I was completely wrong with that. But as a segue here into the open questions and theories that we want to talk about today, do we think Sylvie really is alive? I mean, we basically got a little bit spoiled by the fact that she's already listed in the credits for season two. That was announced already. But otherwise, we couldn't be sure that she really is alive because a lot of things changed and... Yeah, but she was in the Citadel at the end of time. Hmm. And there, nothing changes. And I think... It, it could, we don't know. I mean, we see that Loki is seeing a different iteration of yeah, Kang. But, and so but I mean in the Citadel itself. And Sylvie was last seen in it and mm. we didn't see how or if she's leaving it. Oh, I mean, if we look at how they up to that point described how time traveling and how the flow of time mm -hmm. works in the MCU, mm -hmm. then you would be right because the present can never be changed. Mm -hmm. So her present at that point is is that she killed he who remained. Yeah. So she could either stay there until the end of time or jump back to another mm -hmm. point in time, which should also in theory not have changed except for if it is a different reality yeah. in theory. And you can already see that is the stuff that I struggled <laughs> a little bit with. I tried to understand a lot of those implications. And I had a lot of ideas and a lot of things made sense. Other things didn't make sense. And maybe I touch on that a little bit in this video. But I guess, and that is my final thought on that when I reached the end of my thought process, that likely we are not supposed to understand it all at this yeah. point. We will understand that in the future. We will see all the implications once yeah. they turn up and we can just wreck our brain all that mm. we want at this point, but we will not get any, uh, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> any more details. Yeah. Okay, the next thing to talk about is the definition of Nexus events as they were shown to us in the show. And I think they did a very nice explanation without really spelling it out for us. But as He Who Remains said, basically everything that would lead, as far as I understand, everything that would lead to one of the other variants of Kang mm -hmm. to reach power or to strike out, everything that would create a timeline where another Kang might challenge him would be an Nexus event. Yeah, that's, so that's how I understand it too. Exactly. So it will be interesting to see if they explain how Loki getting the Tesseract, how Sylvie just playing with her toys would challenge that. But ultimately, I guess, thinking about that, that's actually exactly the explanation, right? So he who remained was laying out the path for them to reach him. Mm -hmm. And that for sure would be something that might create a scenario like we see mm -hmm. as Sylvie killed him a scenario where other Kangs might emerge so that they both being in existence and following that path might be a Nexus event is then correct, but it is a Nexus event that he planned to yeah. happen because he wanted them there. 
Yeah. It still doesn't really 100% explain why they took Sylvia at that point in time. Mm -hmm. But they needed to put Sylvia on a path where she landed there. So maybe that's the explanation. Interesting. Mm. Okay, one big thing for me was, did that show now change our perception of a sacred timeline? Like we just said before, everything that would create another Kang variant that might take over is a Nexus event. And he tried to streamline everything so that that doesn't happen. So that is mm -hmm. this sacred timeline. So there are an infinite number of different universes or parallel realities in which all different things might happen and everything can be completely different. The only thing that really made them shape into the sacred timeline is that they don't allow another Kang to emerge. Yeah. Where I was struggling a little bit is that a lot of people in the internet thought that all the different realities were just forced into one reality. Merged into one? Yeah. That wouldn't make any sense. How would you merge two timelines or two realities? There mm. would be some people double and triple and yeah, you know they, what. Yeah, they and would have been erased, but yeah. then there couldn't have been an old Loki yeah. as a variant because... Yeah. This reality still would exist and they just took him from the timeline because he did something that he wasn't supposed yeah. to, yeah. but he was supposed to exist at least. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I didn't understand why those rumors were there, but I at least spent a lot of time thinking through if there is any other implication that was changed by what he said in the end. The only thing that might be different is this loop that is now this displayed as a loop. This way. Exactly. They showed that in the episode at the start, basically with the Big Bang and going through the whole loop and ending at the end of time and then it starts again, I guess. Mm -hmm. Maybe Kang already saw that happening multiple times. But at the end of the day, it is just something that tells us that the universe expanded, starting with the Big Bang and will end, as some scientists says, when everything is pulling together again and then it restarts. So it was more the symbol for that. And not as some people said that everything happens in a mm. circle and everything repeats itself. So I, I didn't understand it that way, but I spent a lot of time mm. thinking about that. Yeah. Did you have uh, no. any, any other idea there? Okay. And maybe a small Easter egg at that point. The show was supposed to end with Kang just being an end gag. So being some kind of a mid credit sequence where they reveal, oh, it was Kang. He was originally not planned to be such a big part of the episode. Yeah. So that was something that the creators revealed in talking about deleted scenes. And that would explain why we have seen so many scenes in the trailers, like the variant of Loki that is the king mm -hmm. standing in his court. Mm -hmm. That was gone and all the other stuff. And those were supposed to be scenes where Loki and Sylvie were tempted by Miss Minute in the opening scene of the episode. So basically we would have seen much more things. What could have been? Different things, exactly what <laughs> could have been in their lives if they would accept that offer to be put on the timeline together to get everything that they ever wanted. Mm -hmm. So they cut out all of this stuff and made it very straightforward for both of them to say, we don't want that, we create our own destiny which I think is fitting quite well into the scenario we have. The other thing would have also worked, but I guess at the end of the day, it's more interesting to have Kang explaining all this stuff. And it was a very intense scene and very well acted scene. So I really enjoyed him being there. And without him, I don't know if I would have liked this finale as much as I did. Yeah, I don't know. I could understand Loki if he would have taken the chance to make different choices and to be put back in a place where his mother would be alive hmm. and everything would be different. So that I could understand that hmm. we saw how emotional he hmm. is and how he has developed in the series. Hmm. And yeah, it would have been interesting too. Both ways to end the series are okay in my opinion. It would have been interesting to see how they would have ended it yeah. the other way around. If Kang would have been an end gag only, then what would have happened? Because now the big change is we have a different iteration of Kang. Mm -hmm. Everyone forgetting about who Loki actually is. Mm -hmm. We have He Who Remains being dead. If he would have been just uh, presented as an end gag, we might have only learned about what happened in the next season. So it would have been interesting to know what would have been different in the complete ending of a series mm -hmm. or a season. Yeah. 
But one thing though about Kang as he who remains that I was a little bit baffled about was the fact that he knows exactly what happens. He knows how they would react. He could even program his time pad to jump when they tried to kill him. But then there was a point in time which from a storytelling standpoint I find interesting. The point which he called the threshold. Yeah. After which he doesn't know anymore what happens. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really saw a logical explanation for that. Why would he all of a sudden be not able to see what happens yeah, from that point forward? Maybe because that was a point when someone else would take his place. Maybe in what way ever. Hmm. And maybe that was the reason he wasn't able to look behind it or to see what, what really yeah. happened. Or maybe he just didn't want to and yeah, made it like this. Yeah, it's possible too. So that he also has a little bit of thrill. Yeah. Maybe he just didn't want to know if he yeah. would get killed or not. Yeah. And he said before that he lived a long, long life and that he was very much older than mm. he appeared. Mm. And I think he didn't want to do it anymore. Mm. And so he was active searching for mm. someone mm. someone who was replacing him. Mm. For him it didn't make a difference if he would be dead or... Yeah, where would he go if he wouldn't been killed? I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah. He could go anywhere in time or, as long as he doesn't influence anything. Or maybe he would have died naturally because he was maybe. millennia old or something like yeah. that. And he would dribble into dust or something yeah, like they, that. They didn't explain really why he could live that long if that yeah. was being his powers harnessing by Lyoth living at the end of time or whatever. Yeah. So or if the citadel of time at exactly. the end of time had something to do with it or something like that yeah we don't know okay one thing we can really just speculate about is we see that everything changed in the tva and the tva is something that exists as we were told outside of time outside yeah. of the reality that everyone is living in yeah but we don't know how we don't know how that's true but do we expect and that is something i guess everyone is theorizing about now does that also mean that the history of the MCU might change? Because some theories, of course, are going around saying, hey, that is the perfect opportunity to bring in the X-Men, to bring in Deadpool and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. But do we really think that that happens? I don't know. At this point, I think only the TVA changed. Maybe it's kind of a reset. We saw, instead of the timekeepers, we saw a statue of Kang in the background. And we really don't know uh, how long the TVA existed, how time's changing there, and how it all works. And I don't know how old, for example, Rabona is. I think she mentioned, and a lot of people took that literally, that she said to Mobius, we have a friendship that went on for eons, that means for more than thousands of years. Yeah, and mm. that's what I mean. I really don't know how it works for real. Mm. And it's all just theories. And I think it's only the TVA that's for now impacted. And we will see what happens in the next season. Mm -hmm. But of course, I would hope that the MCU would be changing so that we can see mutants and so on from the X-Men. And of course, I hope that some of our heroes that passed away in Avengers Endgame, that there would be a possibility that they would come back, like Black Widow or Vision and so on. And mm. yeah, okay, but some characters couldn't come back because, yeah. Mm. I mean, I know that this would be a one-off because now uh. everything, they have the chance to change stuff. For instance, I talked about that with Paul and he said it would really lessens the emotional impact of a death of one mm. of our loved heroes if they just can be arbitrarily being brought back. Yeah, Again, it, sure. it would be it would be a one-off here, so it wouldn't be something they can pull off all the time. Yeah, but we lost so many. Captain America's <laughs> gone, and Black Widow, and Iron Man, and Vision, and yeah, Black Panther. But, yeah. but, but you cannot bring him back, unfortunately. Yeah, I know, I know. That was what I mentioned earlier. Some of them can't be brought back. Yeah. But I think it was too much loss that we had to... <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it was too much for me. Uh, yeah. I mean, one thing I talked about with Paul also was the fact that they could always pull off a trick like that now that we have established a multiverse. Let's say Spider-Man dies. 
And then you just take him from five minutes before from the timeline. Yeah. You put him back there. You would then create a new universe, a new reality at that point where you take him. Mm -hmm. And they would not have a Spider-Man as well, but you mm -hmm. would have them in the main timeline again. Mm -hmm. But this trick for sure then would completely diminish the effect of anything that could happen to them. Yeah. Because you, you would just not trust them that this is a permanent thing. Yeah, okay, but... <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, they, they could take the chance to at least fix the stuff they want to fix right now. Yeah. One time and one time only. I want Vision back. But then they, Vision is still alive. Yeah, he, it's, but, it's but the they real body us... and he has the real memory still. They are just <laughs> hidden. They just yeah. need to reactivate and, and Black them. Black Widow, I don't know why. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I want Black Widow back. We saw the movie Black Widow. Yeah, hmm. some days ago. And I really liked it, and it's sad. I hoped at the end... Okay, no spoilers, no spoilers, guys. So, sorry, I won't want uh, any more. But yeah, yeah at the end, I was hoping for something that didn't came, and I was a little bit disappointed, and so... I, I, I mean, for Black Widow, at the end of the day, you cannot even give any spoilers. Everyone <laughs> knows that she survived it, and everyone knows that in Endgame, she dies. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. uh, so there is no surprise there. The movie itself was quite nice, but what disappointed me a little bit was maybe a small spoiler that I was expecting something that at least opens a door to bring her back. Yeah. And they didn't yeah, show anything in that yeah. regards. But now in Loki they did that and now they could basically, as you said, bring everyone back. But we will see what happens there. Yeah. But what I wanted to say is what we have learned so far in Endgame and the Endgame time travel rules were you cannot change the present. Mm -hmm. If you are traveling back in time, then everything that you are changing there would create a new reality, a new timeline, and it would become your past. If you travel to the future, that would become your past because everything happened in a chronological order regarding what you do and where you jump uh, to. Timeline, time travel it's, is all a little bit... <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit different yeah. in the MCU. So that's why I think that in theory, if everything we have seen so far in the MCU is one timeline, yeah. in theory, nothing should change by this branching out of the sacred timeline. Mm -hmm. Because we have seen one timeline that now as a web might be a completely weird shape. But if you just put it down as one timeline, it still would be a timeline. No. It would still work like that. And again, in theory, nothing should have changed because that is the timeline that we are looking at. But the big question is, do we stick with that one timeline or now with introducing the multiverse with Doctor Strange coming up? Yeah. Do we embrace the fact that there are more stories to be told and more universes to look at? And I guess in What If in the show, for sure, we will see some stuff from other universes. But I'm really interested in seeing how that plays out because for me personally, and that's the same with the DC TV shows, that also did the trick with all those Earths just being put into <laughs> one big Earth and everything is merging. For me, it was that way that only the reality that our main heroes are living in are really relevant. And that is the real world for me. So if they now start to create stories where other realities are shown, then I'm not sure if that has the same impact on me as seeing our main heroes on our main Earth. In the comics, it already is like that. Or um, I think that, it is so. Yeah. yeah, they they are calling it a storyline from Earth uh, exactly. 100. Five maybe or yeah. something like that. Exactly, but that might just be my personal opinion. But uh, I know that some people think the same. That I say only the events on the Earth and in the reality that we are familiar with mm -hmm. right now is the real one for mm -hmm. me, in quotations. Because everything else is, even though it is a real reality and a real universe, it is not the one we are invested mm -hmm. in. So for me, it would mean uh, very little what happens to the people there, even though they are also real, because it's not the one that I've followed for years now. Okay. And I think about the Spider-Man animated hmm. movie with the uh, <laughs> <laughs> multiverse with, how was his name, Morales, that we yeah. uh, followed as the main character. 
and we saw our Peter Parker from our reality mm. and I really liked it. I really found it interesting to see the different heroes we know with the different characters they were. That's for sure interesting, but it would have had the same impact if one of those died and not your main hero. And I mean, that is also even a smaller thing because it's just a standalone movie and you have not seen like 15 other movies before that leading up to it, you know? Oh, it's difficult because I really read some comic lines and over time there were different characters of Spider-Man and they started with Peter Parker and the next Spider-Man would be you know what, uh, yeah. you know who. Some of these comic arcs were very interesting and so if you were a comic book fan and you read them mm. then you're already familiar with them if you see them in the movie yeah. and then for those people it would be different <laughs> if some I, I, other I, version of Spider-Man would die. I guess so. If you have time <laughs> to have really <laughs> read all that stuff then I guess you are a lot more invested than myself <laughs> that's for sure. But again for me as mainly watching the movies and just having read a handful of comics. Yeah. I'm invested in that one reality and the rest that just didn't feel that real and mm -hmm. I'm interested in seeing if they make it more real, if that is even the plan, you yeah. know, so maybe they also shut everything down, maybe they do the same trick as yeah. DC and just say, hey, now let's just merge everything into one timeline. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I... they cannot do that because then they would have let everyone else die mm -hmm. and just pick and choose the ones they want to have on their timeline. Mm -hmm but they might do, and that is leading into another easter egg, they might do something where they at least change some of it and bring some of the characters from other realities into our, mm. that they maybe let them bleed over with some explanation. I don't know if that is the right way to do it and if I like it, but it would make sense again to bring in Deadpool and the X-Men like that. Yeah. And the easter egg I mentioned is why a lot of people think that way, is that in the final episode they had a lot of those golden veins running mm -hmm. through the citadel mm -hmm. and it was basically present everywhere even in the small representation of he who remains when he was standing as a small figurine yeah. and they had the sacred timeline around there so everywhere were those golden strings those golden lines which according to one video i saw is a hint to a japanese form of art to repair stuff so basically something that is broken can be repaired by using gold and making it stronger than it was before. Okay. So I hope I'm quoting that correctly. I haven't researched it, so sorry if that is wrong, but that is what I heard there. And that way they could explain that as a foreshadowing that they say they take the characters they want to make the whole reality we have stronger to build them in uh, okay. that way. If that works like that, how they would do it, we will see. But that is a big theory that is out there. As long as I see some of the dead heroes back in our <laughs> timeline again, everything is fine for me. <laughs> Let's maybe jump into another quick easter egg and that is something I only noticed on the second viewing. You only watched it once, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, you are forgiven if you haven't noticed this okay. as well. So I was wondering how they know where Ravona as a real person was residing and they were in high school and they found her there. And she was a teacher or mm -hmm. the... The principal. Principal of the school, yeah. I was wondering at that moment, how did Hunter B-15 know to go there? Have you seen the explanation why... No. No? That, that was explained very sneakily because Mobius has seen in some previous episodes that she was using a pen from that high school. Yeah, I remember. And then when they showed the high school, they even showed a big glass full of those pens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I uh, when I saw that the second time around, I was like, hey, that's the reason. Okay. That's where they made the connection. Yeah, yeah. So that was a nice one. But talking of Ravona, what do you think where she is going? And what do you think was in the information that Miss Minutes gave her in the notepad? Where she said, hey, that is not what I'm asking for. But she said, that is what he thinks is more useful to you. Yeah, I really don't know. I totally ignored that Miss Minute had given her something. And so I thought uh, she was also going to the void, to the citadel at the end of time, to talk with he who remains in person. 
now that wouldn't make any sense. I really don't know. It's a weird situation. So if she was there before the two of them arrived, in theory that would be possible. She could yeah. jump wherever she likes, as long as it's before the end of time. Yeah. But it also would make not much sense because he's not there anymore. Yeah. We don't even know if she's still there, if in the reality now, after everything changed, she is still in place or if she has left. If Mobius still would remember her, that is something we will need to see in season two. Yeah. So I really believe that she's doing something to hold on to the TVA, of course, mm. because she said so that it's important to remain the mm. timeline. No. And um, yeah, but what uh, she really was doing, where mm. Miss Minute Center or... Well, I mean, that's a good call out. So maybe she was just giving some information about how the sacred timeline works and about different Kang versions and mm -hmm. stuff. So maybe she is off to see another Kang and maybe she teamed up with the one who is in charge now. So just to keep the TVA. Mm. We are nearing the end of my list and one last thing about Sylvia I wanted to mention is, and that is also something I talked about with a lot of people, is that it was almost borderline sexist to make Sylvie the one who is completely against thinking about stuff and she was just completely emotional in the end and just acting on impulse, which of course you could also argue is in line with her character. So I would not really buy into that and saying, yeah, that is sexist because her character was built that way that she was taken as a kid. She was misused in that way. She was on the run all the time and everything led to that moment. And of course, she is not changing it just because the guy is telling her some stupid stuff. Uh, yeah, and I really think that she was taken as a child and I feel that her whole emotions feel really childish. Hmm. And she has so much rage, which she can control, and she wouldn't listen to our Loki when he argumented against it. And yeah, for me, it, it really felt like she was still the little child, the little eight, nine, ten year old girl hmm. we saw playing there. Yeah. And yeah, and so it felt uh, till the end for me. I mean, not 100% like that, but you're for sure right that she was taken as she was like 10 years old. And yeah. then she was on the run and had no one to really connect with. Yeah, she was always so. alone. She had no parents, no sisters, no siblings, no other persons to show her how to react mm. in a normal way. Mm. And so she only had her childish emotions mm. from then. And uh, her, yeah. Uh, I mean, she of course grew up, but she had some deficits in there because yeah. she was growing up alone. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and also what I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. <laughs> was in the scene in there, he who remains was showing Loki and Sylvie that he had seen everything and he knows exactly what will happen mm -hmm. now. And he shows them the paper. Mm with what they will say next <laughs> uh, we see that there's loki's identity number again mm. l1130 and then we see that sylvie is l1190 so i would have thought that her id would be lower than our loki's okay because she was taken in an earlier point of time and that they were both born on the same day but in different realities Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was for me something that I didn't understand. Why is Sylvie's number higher than Loki's? I mean, at the end of the day, we know that the time is different in the TVA. So mm -hmm. uh, they would get those numbers based on the fact when they were taken in their timeline. Mm -hmm. And there you are then right that she was taken earlier, but she was never processed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe she just got that number after yeah, she was okay. caught at the end of the show. So then yeah, it would be that... after our okay. Loki was taken. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Okay. But yeah. it's an interesting thing if they even talk about those numbers or if the numbers end up just to be some references to comics again. Yeah, and that would also mean for me that the L really stand for Loki variants <laughs> because if it would be the theory about the first names uh, with the other employees of the TVA with Hunter B15 and C20, I thought their first names started with C and B. And yeah, <laughs> so that would for me mean that there really were so many variants of Loki. Either that or that the TVA staff is quite small. <laughs> but if we remember the scene where Loki looked out of the window, 
there was so much going on. There were so much vehicles flying yeah. around. So that needed to be a very large city so that even if you have every letter with a thousand mm -hmm. variants behind it, it would still be quite little. But yeah. we will see if they even touch on that in the next season. Okay, so I only have one more question on my notepad. And it's quite a stupid question, but I saw the episode like three times. The first time, of course, is to enjoy the episode. The second time is to do some notes for the review. And the third one is to just create some questions for our video. Mm -hmm. And on that view, I noticed that these miniature Kangs that were fighting against each mm -hmm. other. And before I continue, I know there was something regarding the multiple Kangs you wanted to mention, right? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to mention was that it's normal for Kangs in the comic to team up and create chaos or something together. What our Lokis wouldn't do <laughs> normally, normally. And yeah, and also there are so many variants of Kang and every variant has another background story. Mm. So we have, uh, for example, Victor Timely or Pharaoh uh, Ramatut and Blue Man and so on, uh, <laughs> all, uh, that are all Kang characters or King of Kings or Master of Men and <laughs> Lord of the Seven Sons and so on. Yeah, there are so many kings. <laughs> sometimes they work with each other, sometimes they are good, sometimes they are bad. Yeah, yeah definitely. Sometimes they change course and whatever. Yeah. Okay, nice call out. What I was going at was the fact that you have seen these miniatures of Kang fighting. Mm -hmm. And when you see those miniatures of Kang, you can also see that they are using technology that the TVA has in use. So you see that those Kangs are using prune sticks. Mm -hmm. Some of them also have those time reset mm -hmm. charges. Where I was thinking, was the TVA in place already at that point and those Kangs were using it? Or were Kangs using it before the TVA was created and they already had that place at the end of time where they would send people in their wars that they fought? What, what do you think? Um, I think he who remains told us that he was from the 31st century and that he was a scientist mm. and they had really great inventions there and that he found out that there were other realities and that they exchanged their knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so I would think that until the first one started to think, hey, I must conquer them all, I must be the king of all realms, <laughs> that, yeah, I think the technology was first and then he who remains used this technology mm. for the TVA. So you would also think that they already had the technology to send people to the end of time yeah. to just erase complete realities yeah. that way and they might have used that in yeah. those wars. Yeah, I really think so. Okay, I uh, hope they will elaborate on that in the show. Yeah, and Kang is a master of time and space and so it's for me logical that all this invention that has something to do with time and time travel mm -hmm. yeah, came from him. Okay, so do you have anything else? No, that was all on my list. Okay, so then we are nearing the end of this video and it was a very, very entertaining season. Yeah, I really uh, liked it. The last show, as I mentioned before, was a little bit tough for me because I really spent too much time thinking about it. And I also said in the review video that would I have just rated it right away from what I felt in my stomach? It would have not been 9 out of 10 for the last episode. It was the right thing to do, I guess, going that way, but it felt wrong because you felt a little bit disappointed that they don't stay together, yeah. that she betrayed him. But just because it wasn't a happy end doesn't mean it wasn't a good end. It was a very or solid better. thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, so we are interested in seeing what the next season will yeah, bring. Yeah. And for sure what the impact on the MCU is, yeah. which we cannot see right now and which might mean everything as we discussed in this video today. I'm really excited to see the movie Doctor Strange and the Multiverse. I'm interested also, I, yeah. I don't know even if it is before Doctor Strange or after the Ant-Man movie, mm -hmm. where Kang is playing a very big yeah, role. Yeah, we don't know. But ultimately, yeah, so even what if the next series could be something yeah. that is now more important than we thought before. Yeah. Okay, so let's bring it to the end. If you have some comments regarding what we said, please let us know in the comments. But what I want to say now in the end is, 
that my sister and I, we talked a lot about that stuff and we, we thought that we want to dedicate this series of videos we did for Loki to our father who recently passed away. And in the beginning I was a little bit against it because I like to do those videos and I really put a lot of myself in it. But it is not something where I say, hey, it's worthy of be dedicated to him because he is much more than just just a side note in a video. But my sister and I, we did so much work on those videos and we enjoyed it. And it is the first series of videos we did together. And my father was a big influence on us in regards of being a movie buff. He at least sparked the, the interest in us and he, he would have loved this show as he would loved all the, all the Marvel stuff he's missing now. So dedicated to you, Dad. Yeah, sorry. I can't speak right now. I miss you so much. I really love you and thank you for everything you taught us. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. It's hard for me to talk about it um, still and I um, wanted to say that I really miss my dad, our dad, and I really love him and he taught us so much and yeah, he gave us so much and he's really missed. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. <laughs> okay, so see you soon, guys. Bye. Bye.